Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Testy, the president and the CEO of the Law School Admission Council and a former law school dean and professor. And I wanna start by saying that I'm just so thrilled you're here with us today. I know we have a big audience and I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. These are difficult times across our world. And uh, I hope that you all stay safe as we continue to navigate the pandemic. It's inspiring though, to see so many people interested in law and justice because goodness, do we need your voices. So thank you so much for, for joining us. I wanna let you know, because we have so many people joining us today, we may not get to every question, but my team's gonna look for patterns and let us know some of the common ones and we'll try and answer as many as we can. So please know that uh, if you have a question, put it in the, in the uh, questions and we'll be glad to try and get to that. And my team will help me do that. And then there'll also be a recording available of this webinar on lsac.org. So if you need to rewatch or suggest it to someone else that you know, then you can catch that anytime that you may have missed that. Well, again, I'm so glad you're with us and it is a great honor for me today to introduce our panel. And so I wanna welcome each of the three panelists and then we'll get started with some questions that I have for them and a dialogue about uh, law school admissions in the time of COVID. Let me first welcome Judge Diane Humitiwa. Judge Humitiwa was appointed as a federal judge for the US District Court for the District of Arizona by President Barack Obama in 2014. And that, um, that made her the first Native American woman in US history to hold the position of federal judge. Uh, she has a distinguished career prior to becoming a judge, uh, including uh, serving as deputy counsel for the US Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, as counsel to the deputy attorney general for the US Department of Justice's Office of Tribal Justice, and as the US attorney for the District of Arizona among a variety of other teaching and private practice uh, work that she's done. Uh, judge Humitua is a member of the Hopi tribe and has also served as both judge uh, of, on the appellate court and is acting chief prosecutor for the Hopi tribe in Kearns Canyon, Arizona. So uh, Judge Humitua, I want to welcome you. It's really nice to have you with us today and a great honor. I'm very happy to participate and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. It's also a delight for me today to introduce to you Justice G Helen Whitener. Justice Whitener was appointed to the Washington State Supreme Court in April of 2020 and that made her the first black woman to serve on that court. She's also the fourth immigrant born justice and the first openly gay black judge in the state of Washington. Prior to her appointment in the Washington State Supreme Court, she served as a Pierce County Superior Court judge, also as both, both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and as a managing partner of a law firm, to name just a few of the important roles that Justice Whitener has held. She is distinguished in our legal community in Washington for a commitment to justice and equality. And Justice Whitener, I'm so pleased to welcome you here today. Thank you for having me, Dean Testy. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And I am just thrilled to welcome my colleague in the admission world, uh, Dean Monica Ingram, the Associate Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at Cornell Law School. Prior to becoming an admission professional, Dean Ingram practiced law in the area of public education. She's deeply committed to public service and volunteerism. She's served on a number of boards and Thank goodness she's also served actively with LSAC over the years and is truly one of the admission deans that uh, we and all of my colleagues around the country admire so very much. With her experience and perspective as a representative of the community, she'll be able to add some key insight about the admission process to our conversation today. And I know a lot of you will really appreciate that as you continue your enrollment journey. And I wanna say about that, please do continue your enrollment journey. We need you in law and uh, uh, wanna make sure you know that we're all here to help you make that journey successfully. So panelists, I wanna get started. Uh, I've been just so looking forward to having a conversation with you. And so I wanna ask you to start with sharing some opening remarks about your own story and what led you to consider a career in law so that the students and candidates can learn from you. And uh, Judge Hamitawa, I will ask you to go first, please. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, my story about how I came to law school is kind of a lengthy one. So I'm gonna to try to make this a very brief um, uh, story. I actually, after undergrad, worked for the US Attorney's Office as a victim advocate. And I did that for about four years. It was one of the new positions that was uh, brought about by President Reagan. And in that work, I didn't realize that a lot of um, federal crimes uh, that occurred on Indian reservations were prosecuted by the US Attorney's Office in the federal courts. And so I uh, had direct um, exposure to the federal courts advocating for many of the victims who um, had to be there as a witness or a victim. And I guess through that work, um, I came to the attention of a number of lawyers that were in the office who were very uh, nice and kind and always encouraging. And one of the lawyers uh, kept telling me, you really need to go to law school. You need to be the voice of these victims because they, they can connect with you. And one day I walked in and my supervisor had three packets of law school applications there on my desk. And she says, you need to fill these out. And I, I, I am the first to graduate in my family uh, from a uh, university. And I had no you know, professionals in my uh, family. I had, my, my mother went to a junior college and my father did have a very good engineering job with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but we had no lawyers, doctors and, and the like in our family. And so I had not the first clue about what it meant to go to law school. And so I did a lot of asking and so on and so forth, filled out the applications and lo and behold, I was accepted. <laughs> so that's how I got into law school. I really love that story, Judge. And uh, I share your background as a first generation college attendee and graduate. And, and I want to say to all of our candidates today that regardless of where you start, um, we're here to help. And uh, Judge, your story is so inspiring and showing what that pathway can be. So thank you for sharing that. I'm really glad you filled out those applications. <laughs> um, Judge Whitener, I'd love to hear a little bit about your, uh, Justice Whitener, excuse me, I'd like to hear a little bit about your story and uh, your pathway to law. Well, um, mine is also very long, but the truncated version is I had a background, have a background in international marketing. Um, having graduated undergrad in New York and I ended up in Alaska and um, practicing and I got tired of the cold weather. And as you know, I'm an immigrant from the island of Trinidad and Tobago. So I was heading back towards Trinidad and Tobago or some warm weather. Friend invited me to Washington state and I couldn't find a job in international marketing. So I ended up taking a job in an accounting firm. And what's interesting is sometimes you work outside of the legal profession that guides you towards the law. And that's what happened with me. One of the partners at the accounting firm was also a lawyer. And I never knew anyone who was both an accountant and a lawyer. And I did a project for him. And he said, after I completed it, have you ever considered law school? And I asked him where he went and he mentioned UPS, which is now Seattle U Law. And without doing any research, because at the time I had no idea there were three law schools in Washington state, I just applied to where he went. In figuring out whether or not I can do, you know, um, attend law school, I realized you had to take the LSAT. And it, you, you know, to take the course needed money. Well, my family wasn't in this country. Everyone for me was on the island and I didn't have the money. So I took, <laughs> I used my law library card and took the book out and sat at my kitchen table every evening and kept renewing it every time because it took me a while to work through it. And then I applied to Seattle U Law and they had a program called the Academic Resource Center, which dealt with students like me with some sort of different background that needed that extra assistance. And I guess the rest is history. It, and I always say this, it doesn't matter how you get in because at the end of the day, you have to do the work to continue on. So that was my path to getting into law school. Justice Whitener, what a great path that is. And I, and I know uh, everyone at Seattle U is sure glad you, you began your studies there and that 
gets to they get to call you uh, theirs. They're so proud of uh, you being named justice on the Supreme Court uh, recently. Um, I want to say too that you'll be happy to hear, I think, Justice Whitener, that that uh, LSAC now has free LSAT preparation uh, in partnership with the Khan Academy, and that and students love that platform with the Khan Academy to to do that and. Also through uh, our own Law Hub uh, interface and product, we offer free LSAT prep as well. That is so, wonderful. Uh, let's, let's, I think it's just so important that we all keep working together to reach out widely and help uh, open up access. And uh, I wanna remind candidates too that LSAC also has a fee waiver program uh, for um, those with financial challenge. So again, please let us know how we how we can help as you continue your journeys. Uh, thank you, Justice Whitener and uh, Dean Ingram. I want to invite you into this conversation now and um, hear how uh, now that you work in helping others find their path. What was your what was your path, Dean, into this uh, this great profession? Well, my path was nothing like the strong organization that LSAC provides. It's not that LSAC didn't exist when I went to law school, they did. I just knew nothing about them other than they did the LSAT. Um, I come from what I would call a mixed education background. On my mother's side of the family, uh, I'm at least a third generation college graduate. But on my father's side of the family, I am the first college graduate and my sister is actually the second. I grew up in Columbus, Georgia uh, in the 70s and early 80s. And so while it wasn't a product, an immediate product of the civil rights movement, certainly being um, a child of the deep South uh, raised in Georgia, lawyers and judges, their um, accomplishments, their leadership were first, were forefront, uh, foremost in the minds of kids like me and uh, our parents. And so it was always a profession that I aspired to, but I took my mother's path. Instead of going to school, to going to college, and then immediately going um, to law school, I did what she did. Uh, my father died when my sister and I were young and my mother got her master's degree. She left and we moved to Nebraska. And she got her master's and then she came back to Georgia and worked. And then when my sister and I actually finished college, my mother went back and got her PhD at K-State. And so I always knew that I could go back and um, to go and get my law degree. Well, I worked, I was out nine years before I went back to law school. I was what we would consider a non-traditional student. And I was working in Minneapolis, Minnesota for a small privately held company. And we started working on what was, we considered the mutual respect policy kind of a cross between a sexual harassment policy and a discrimination policy working for a total quality management company. And it just reminded me of why I wanted to go to law school in the first place. And the timing was right. I was 30 years old and I was confident that I was either going to be 33 with a law degree or 33 without one, but I planned on being 33. And so I decided that that was the time that I was going to pursue law school. And I checked a number of boxes on the admission side, but I didn't know that. I was um, African-American, female, non-traditional, an army brat, but I had no clue that that was significant. I just knew that I had this aspiration and I didn't know anything about forums. I didn't know, I didn't have a relationship with a pre-law advisor at my college. So I was old school. I went to the library and I got a book <laughs> and I read about different law schools. And then I got a sample book about setting for the LSAT. And I so wish I had known <laughs> about the resources LSAC had, about the forums, and I wish the Khan Academy was available to me at that time, and it wasn't. I can't complain. I did all right, but um, uh, law and the profession and being a lawyer was always very, very important to me, and it, it remains so. Thank you so much, Dean. And uh, well, I think I think yes, you did all right is an understatement, and uh, that uh, that's for sure. Well, we all have our our unique journeys. It's it's fun for me to hear so many ways that I that uh, that I personally even overlap with each of you. You know, I uh, Justice Whitener, I applied to one law school too, and and uh, and Dean Ingram, I uh, I had about six years in between undergrad and law, and uh, so I just I just share that because I think that. 
uh, candidates need to know that the schools really do value your experience and there's no one right pathway. Uh, you find your pathway. So that leads me to ask uh, the panelists, and I'm gonna go in the same order I went in this the, the prior time, just to give candidates any advice that you have right now for those who are considering applying to law school. You know, what would you say that candidates would wanna think about as they, you know, they have maybe more information than some of us had, but what should they think about and consider as they're choosing where to go to law school. And um, Judge Hamidua, I will ask you to go first again, please. Well, I think um, you are all very fortunate in that there's an abundance of information available to you um, online about all of these law schools. So I think um, the way that I would suggest approaching it is uh, a couple of ways. I would first consider are there specialty areas of law that you're interested in? Are you interested in, for example, environmental law, healthcare law, patent law? Well, what are the law schools that really focus on those areas? I think today we see a lot of uh, specialized focus of practice areas um, by various law schools. So that's one, one way to look at it. The second way, and this really came from a mentor who's now a senior district judge in uh, down the hall from me. Um, when I was getting ready to go to law school and people were telling me about different places to go to law school, he, he suggested this. He said, where are you going to live? If you already know that you want to continue residing in the Phoenix area, for example, you probably really should think about going to law school here locally because you will become familiar with your classmates who will probably also be here practicing. And you also have the opportunity to intern throughout your law school career or um, have summer externships with the local people here. So you'll begin to build a network uh, that will stead you well once you get out of law school. You'll be familiar to people. And I think that was really important advice to me because if you can imagine uh, picking up roots and going to a law school, you're going to have to start all over again. So I think those were really kind of two of the, the things that I would think about. Thank you, Judge. That's very helpful. You know, our law schools really do create these ecosystems in the communities in which they reside. And, and there, you start to build those networks while you're in law school, not just once you're out. So that's a really important point. Justice Whitener, um, I'd love to hear some advice you may have for candidates as they consider uh, applying to school and then choosing which school. Uh, what would you advise? I, I would agree with what the judge just said. Um, for me, support mechanisms, I had none. I had no connection to anyone in this country, much less, well, in the state. I did have family members in New York and the option of going back to New York was there. But as I said, I, I didn't do much research in regards to the law. I thought I would be a teacher. So support mechanisms um, are necessary. I also think a discussion with family members. At the time I applied to law school, I was involved in a relationship where we were raising four girls and my ex uh, was 20 years older than me. So having that discussion because it was going to take a toll on the family. Um, they weren't our kids. They were her children's um, children. They, the parents became um, victims of the war on drugs. So we had that to deal with. Um, understanding how much time commitment is required because that can also um, affect how you address law school. Understanding whether or not you will need financial assistance. I held down three jobs, literally, um, with no sleep, raising four kids and making sure I came home, helped them with their homework. And then I had to do my studying while they were sleeping in the middle of the night. And you know what that is like because sometimes you get 100 pages for one class as an assignment. So I think understanding and having the discussion with family members is truly important because it's a team effort. I saw too many relationships end 
during the, the law school process. So I think that's important as well. Support is not just necessarily from the law school, but you need that family and, and, and um, friends support mechanisms to be in place so they understand what you're going through. Um, another thing I think is important is understanding that this is an opportunity to define who you are by understanding what you want to get out of the experience itself. I went in thinking I wanted to do business law since my background was international marketing and I had eight years practicing in that field. And I came out loving trial work. One thing I learned was I wanted to be a litigator. It didn't matter what side or what type of law, I just wanted to be a litigator. So I think going in, even though you may have interest, be open to exploring other areas as well. It, it really, there's a wealth of information out there. And I think this ties in with what the judge just said. Choosing the location is integral because if you know going in or you have an idea, you're building that support mechanism there. You're building your networking mechanism right there. And it makes it a lot easier moving up because they're right there to help you. Thank you so much, Justice Whitener. It's really good advice to be thinking about that support network uh, outside the law school and the family as well. And uh, one of the things I always like to share with our candidates is that I love law school for it. It really is, uh, it helps you really become a, a complex problem solver. And it really helps you think about things in a new way. And just like when we learn anything new, sometimes that's hard at the start. Uh, but I just want to make sure you know you can do it, you know, and the, the LSAT is really an on-ramp to that learning because it's helping you develop the reading and the reasoning and the writing skills that will help you so much in law school. And so just realize that that's part of your learning, this new way to really solve problems that law school will help, help cultivate. Now, Dean Ingram, I want to open this up to you. You're the real expert on what candidates should be thinking about as they make this journey. So what's your, what's your best advice to them today? Well, I, what I'd like to share is that I think that for all of the prospective applicants, and certainly those of us who have navigated this process, what's really important is to have a plan. And know that your plan will very well look very different from the person next to you who has a similar aspiration. There's a lot um, in terms of applying to law school. And if you're intimidated by applying to law school, there's a lot more in terms of studying the law once you're in law school. And if you're intimidated by that, there's a lot more in terms of when you're practicing law. And so you really get to know what's important to yourself and to tease out what the judge and the justice said, one of the things that I value the most about where you want to go to law school and how you put this plan together is look at the quality of the education that you're going to receive. And only you know those qualities that are most important to you. It's an opportunity to really test what you know about yourself. I was living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I moved across the country to Austin, Texas to go to law school. And so for me, I had familial support. I ended up having familial support in Texas, but I also had it um, uh, more broadly. And so my friends knew what I was undertaking. My uh, mother knew what I was undertaking. She supported me remotely. My sister and her family were there. They supported me locally and it made a big difference. But I went because I thought the education was important and then the services that the law school provided. And so I was confident that those resources that I needed, especially as a non-traditional student, were going to be there. And then I was confident that the quality of the education was going to serve me well, that I was going to be able to pass the bar. And so those are the kinds of things that you need to answer. And only you know, the prospective applicant, the candidates, how that falls within your matrix of importance. Be honest with yourself. How are you going to finance this education? Whether you go to a private institution or a public institution, law school is expensive. It's a commitment of time and of resources. And while you'll, some way or another, you'll get the resources back, you'll never get that time back. And so it's so important for you to invest in the plan upfront. Do you, is, uh, do you need a small school, a larger, one is fine. Do you need to stay close to home? Do you need to be in a community where you already have an established network? Is that a matter of minimal importance to you? Do you need a car? 
Uh, a lot of students coming from the big city don't drive. And so they need to go to a school that has support that's in the community where a car isn't necessary. And those things seem pedestrian now, but when it comes to making those decisions, they're really, really important. Because when you're in the thick of studying law, those aren't things that you can consider and they end up being distractions. The justice mentioned how relationships are sorely tested during law school, they are. Law school is a very, very selfish time. And it's a selfish pursuit, largely because it's so demanding. And for all of us, the one unifying thing about it is it's foreign to everybody. I don't care what your educational background is, studying law is just different. And so put a plan together, take advantage of all of the resources. I prefer the free ones that are readily available. And I do, I, I'm, I, I'm a huge proponent of that. Start with LSAC, go to the uh, guide for law schools. All of that information is there. Khan Academy, if you need test prep, that's free. Um, invest the time in yourself, work your plan. I think you should consider schools broadly. Foremost, the education, the quality of the education. Get to know the students that are there. Look at the employment outcomes. We're a professional school. So the goal is to be employed upon graduation. And then talk to as many current students as possible. And then secondarily, if there is a position that you aspire to, look at the individuals that hold those positions. Look at their background. That's helpful. It doesn't mean that you have to mirror it, but it can help shape what you're doing and what you look for in the process. Thank you, Dean Ingram. That's uh, such good advice. And I want to remind all the candidates out there that, you know, at every law school, there are people like Dean Ingram who want to help you find your pathway. And LSAC works as the hub with all the law schools and their admission teams. And I can tell you that uh, that we and all of them want to help you have the information you need. And so please know that those resources are out there. A host of things, as Dean Ingram says on our website, including the guide to all the ABA schools, uh, lots of information to help you, um, you know, start to, to make that journey. And um, I want to also say that, you know, many of our, our panelists have noted that law school is a rigorous form of education just remember that there's a reason for that. You're gonna have people's lives in your hands as a lawyer. Our law can really do great things to heal our, our world and, and they can also be used poorly. And so we wanna make sure that, you know, you really become that, that humane problem solver who can really help people with a, with a law degree. Um, Dean Ingram, if I could ask you one follow-up question, then I want to uh, uh, ask the, the judge and the justice uh, a, a little bit more about their work on the court. Um, the follow-up is that many people are writing in questions around, you know, what do you really look for when you're looking for applicants? And I wonder if you could just address that and talk a little bit about how you uh, look at the files that do come in and, and what you're thinking about as you decide uh, on admission. I think it goes without saying that we have over 200 plus ABA accredited law schools and you're going to get a quality education from all of them. What we're looking for on the other side is how we identify students that will contribute to that community because it is a community. You know, um, first year law school looks pretty same uh, across the country, but it's the cultural dynamics that are, I think, different. Um, some schools are mission oriented. Uh, some are skewed um, into one area or others, some are more specialty oriented. And so we're looking at how those students that we select will contribute to that program. I think without a doubt, we want them to be intelligent, smart, uh, and there are various tools that help us identify that. Certainly your academic record is important, not only what your GPA is, but what you studied, where you studied, that rigorous course of study. And it doesn't need to be that you were a straight A student. The challenge, the rigor of the curriculum that you uh, undertook and how well you performed. Um, certainly diagnostics, the LSAT is helpful. It is not 
uh, the sole determiner of who gets admitted to law school, but it is helpful for us. And while we think about the score, the scale is 120 to 180, I think what's more important to think about is the percentile. And so we all think about that. And I don't know one colleague across the country who isn't overseeing a holistic admissions program. I use myself as an example. There were a number of different qualities and I don't know why I was admitted to law school. I think they're proud of me, but I don't know what that determining factor is. And it usually isn't one. Files look different for everyone. And so we don't, we don't have candidate A and candidate B, and then we choose A. Um, there's a lot of room at the table. All of the law schools admit more individuals than we can see, just because you will have a lot of options and choices. I want to know how well you write. I want to know that um, you took challenging coursework. I also want to know that you are essentially a good person. How do you think about others? The law is a service profession and we serve throughout our careers. And even for those of us who are working in a private corporate structure, public interest, public service is very important. So whether it's your vocation or your advocation, that's important. And I want to see evidence of that, that you've attempted that before you've even tried law school. You know, some people come to law school with families. Um, some are straight out of school. So there isn't one uh, pathway. All of us, as you can tell by all the panelists, have these very different trajectories. We want more voices at the table. We want more perspectives. And that it, it works for in the classroom dynamic in terms of instruction um, and how you choose to advocate once you um, graduate from law school, what that advocacy looks like. Hopefully you'll consider the bench, but we, we need you in diverse thoughts, perspectives, backgrounds in both the bench and the bar. And so I caution applicants, candidates, Right now, getting into law school seems the most important thing that you have to do, but you need to know that law school is just a gateway. Ultimately, it's your contribution to the practice and the overall legal community that's very, very, very important. And so we look at a whole lot of things and I'm sorry, I couldn't give you an ABC answer so you could just check off those boxes and know that you were gonna get there, but you'll get there, you'll get there. Thank you, Dean Ingram. They, they will. And it's so good to know that you're looking, and I agree with you, that all the schools are looking holistically at the, at the candidates. So candidates, put your best foot forward and, and let them know who you are and what you want to do with this law degree. As Dean Ingram says, it's about fit and it's about, you know, what do you plan to do once you're empowered with the law degree to make this world a, a better place and to, to take action for the causes and the communities you care about? Now, Justice Whitener, let me come uh, to you and talk a little more directly about uh, being on the bench. You know, Dean, Ing Dean Ingram mentioned that lawyers do so many things. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about what it's like to work in the judiciary and whether there are opportunities um, also for students to work with judges and justices while they're in law school. Can you talk a little bit about your experience on the bench and, and in working with students? I, um, I'll start a little before that. My background, as you know, in the law was as a prosecutor, as a public defender, I did some defense work as well. And again, managing partner in the law firm I started once I left government service. You have to remember, I came from a background that did not have any connection whatsoever with the legal system. And I think many people can relate to that. Um, even though they may not have been an immigrant, but many populations have um, minimal interaction with the legal system, or if they do, it's negative. So for me, I had minimal interaction with the legal system because it was different from the one I grew up under, which is British. And I wanted to make sure I got a good understanding as a litigator of all different aspects as far as litigation and the legal system here and criminal law. Um, I realized I had strengths in that, so I fine-tuned that. When it came time for applying to the Superior Court, I actually had had, had received pro tem experience, that is a judge that sits in for an elected judge when the judge takes leave. So it's an attorney that sits in 
um, for that judge. So I had some experience from a number of judges that saw something, I guess, in me that um, they started putting the bug in me. You know, you could actually aspire to the bench. So I think sometimes it's just getting some um, good words from someone um, that gets you down that path. So I did some of that while I was still practicing as a lawyer. And I realized, and this is what really um, made me want to pursue the judiciary. The first time I put on the robe and I walked out into the courtroom, the change in the people in the courtroom was very evident to me. And it was because they had never seen someone like me on the bench. And I didn't realize that for a while. They had not seen a black female in my county on the bench. Um, so I realized it was really important because I'll tell you, I saw black individuals who were slouched in their seats sit up. You know, I saw white individuals take a double take. And then I realized how important it was um, using myself as an example of possibilities. I mentored a lot. I mentor a lot of individuals and I still do a lot of mentoring because I realized in getting to the bench, others mentored me. So one of the things I, I noted in law school is the connections that you make may come to play later on. And here's an example. My first job in law school was as a teaching assistant for one of the criminal law professors. That same year, I got a job opportunity to be a law clerk with the attorney general's office, but it was going to clash. That professor spoke to the attorney general's office and they held my position until I was finished that term and I could start with them. So remember I told you I had three jobs. But <laughs> so here I was working at the attorney general's office and little did I know that I would meet an individual who would be very important in my life later on. And that was, uh, she was an attorney general at the time, Mary Fairhurst, who then became a Supreme Court justice. I became a judge and I realized it's because of the connections I made throughout the legal profession. Your reputation is everything. You get an opportunity to create a whole new persona, really, as um, the Dean was saying. It's, it's a new field. You've never been a lawyer before and you're meeting people and you're learning things. So in becoming a judge, I realized how important it was to give back and how important it was to represent. Getting to the highest court, I realized how important my voice that I had developed over the years is going to be moving forward because there's never been one like me on this bench. Many of us coming through and those of you applying to law school are gonna realize something. You're gonna be the first in the number of arenas, whether it is the first in your family, whether it is the first in the profession or the job. And you can by your own performance open that door for others or shut it for others. So I always say keep the bar high, but in getting to the judiciary, I think it, it um, came up through mentorship from judges who saw something in me, but the bug in me, I took advantage of that and started doing it. But once I did, seeing the impact you can have with others, and that's something the law does. You know, when you get into the law and you realize the power you learn, by being persuasive with your arguments, by being persuasive with your writing, you really become a whole new person. And the sky is the limit. And I'll end with this. There was no one like me. So what you have to remember, sometimes you're gonna be in that position, create, create that position for yourself by letting others know about you. I remember the first letter I had to write for admittance to law school, and I saw there were some questions regarding this. What do I write? I wrote for my truth. I told them I was an immigrant. I told them I was LGBT. And I remember one sentence I wrote, and I said, I may not be the smartest student you allow in, but I'll be the hardest working student you, <laughs> you ever see. And I lived up to that. So it, it's a wonderful experience, but being flexible and being open to opportunities when they present themselves, I think is huge. And that's how I think I got to the judiciary and have been able to move up the way I did. 
Thank you so much, Justice Whitener. That's a wonderful reminder. And I do think this that when the students express who they are, they're likely to find the better fit. And fit matters because you want to be able to thrive in law school. And when you feel comfortable in yourself and you feel a good fit, that really helps that, uh, that happen. Um, I just want to let everyone know that, unfortunately, uh, Judge Humitawa's uh, internet connection has had an interruption, and so she's not on with us right at the moment, but we're trying to get her reconnected. And so when she comes back on, I'll ask her to talk a little bit about her experience on the bench. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, Dean Ingram, I, I wanted to ask you if you might talk a little bit about um, the differences between judicial internships and clerkships and just what, what do students, how can they get a, a view into the bench while they're in law school? Well, I'm very fortunate to have the um, judge and justice here with us today because they are the experts. But I will tell you from um, the student perspective and from the advising perspective, my thoughts about this. I want every student to consider being a judicial clerk. Now, you may ultimately not choose to, but I want you to think about it. Uh, so much of what we learn about the law, we get from uh, popular culture. Well, entertainment hasn't focused on the bench nearly as much as it has the lives of lawyers. But knowing how the court systems operate, knowing the roles that not only judges and justices play, but how their whole staff um, within their chambers works, the relationship building that goes with that, the opportunity to not only develop um, strong research and writing skills, but the opportunity to expound, uh, to expand your soft skills as well. Um, chambers are small and the relationship dynamic, the interpersonal dynamic is really, really important. I think so much of what we do and what we value is based upon relationships. I'm not the biggest fan of the networking term because I think it, it's, it's misused. I have a large network of individuals that I know and that I interact with, but I've never received a job from one of them that I've known and I've never looked to get one. But I have certainly helped other people advance based upon those relationships that I have. And I think that those are important. When you do a judicial clerkship, it's an opportunity to expand the bandwidth of your career. Now, it isn't for everyone. But know that that relationship, those skills that you learn, that insight that you gain is helpful throughout your career. Every one of the panelists today including Kelly Testy, our moderator, are not doing what we thought we were going to be doing when we finished law school. Careers are long and how prepared you are for those trajectories are really important. I didn't do a judicial clerkship. I thought about it, but I was non-traditional and what I thought the extra time that it would take because I was taking three years out of um, a career that I'd started nine years before. I can't tell you that that was a good decision or not. It was, it was just a decision, but I did do a judicial internship. I still have a relationship with my judge and the fellow um, uh, clerks that were in the office at that time. My judge swore me into the bar um, and I uh, had the honor of speaking with him a couple of months ago. And he's kind enough to say that, but for his retiring from the bench, he would have hired me as a clerk. So I don't know if that is true, but I, I, I can't underscore enough how important it is. And I wanna say this, especially to those of you who have been historically underrepresented in law school, graduate professional education, or first generation. The expense of law school, which I alluded to earlier, is significant, that's just a reality. And so graduating, getting a good job and being able to pay off debt is really important. But I will say to you that if you can delay that by a year or two or start working and then ultimately go back and do a clerkship for a year or two, it will pay off in ways that inure to you more greatly than a lost year of revenue. 
For those of you going into the private sector, firms usually will hold your position for that year or two. Some of you will give you clerk, some of them will give you clerkship bonuses. For those of you interested in public interest, there are elite public interest positions that are looking for individuals that have clerkship experience. Um, and so again, I mentioned earlier, look for those positions that you are highly attracted to. Look at their CVs, their resumes. Have they done a clerkship? Have they done an internship? I just think that they are career builders and in ways that are more valuable intrinsically than even they are extrinsically. And so don't, don't overlook it, don't exclude it. Thanks, Dean Ingram. And uh, my own experience really parallels that advice. I, I clerked for a year after I graduated from law school and I just wouldn't trade that year for anything. I, I learned so much, but more than anything, more than I learned about just the law that year, I learned about how courts work and how judges are trying so hard to do the right thing and, and also where the impediments to some access to justice issues come in. And it just gives you a good sense of the, um, of the judiciary in a very helpful way. Um, I think we may have um, Judge Humetawa back with us now via phone. And I'd like to, uh, if so, ask her to give a little more um, comment on her experience on the, on the bench, you know, what it's like to work in the judiciary and, uh, and some of the issues she may be thinking about today, given what our, our nation is experiencing. So Judge, if, uh, if you're able to hear me, I would welcome your comments on, uh, on working in the, in the judiciary. Okay, very good. Let me just repeat that then. And Judge, I'm sorry for the connection difficulty. Um, I was uh, asking you to give some comments on what it's like to work in the judiciary, uh, your perspective uh, uh, on the bench, and uh, anything you'd like to share about your own experience and the issues you may be thinking about right now as our nation grapples with COVID and, and a number of other tremendously large issues. Oh gosh, um, well, I'm so sorry I was dropped from the connection. And so I missed uh, the other uh, statements by Justice uh, Whitener. But I wanna say, first of all, here in Arizona in the Phoenix division, we are an extremely busy district. We have a very both high civil caseload as well as a very high criminal docket because of our um, federal land masses, the fact that we have an international border and that we have a lot of now um, businesses here. And so um, one of the things that I had to really uh, concentrate on in the early years on the bench was really good time management and good organization about how to address all of these cases, which just I, I realized uh, fairly early on that no matter how hard you work, sometimes your docket never gets any smaller because people are constantly filing new um, cases. Uh, so once you get rid of two, um, there are three more that'll take its place. So, so um, good time management. One of the other things that I will say, it's very isolating. This is a very isolating job. And so it is important that when uh, judges hire law clerks that there is an ability to um, trust uh, one another. And I think um, trust amongst the staff and the court personnel is critical because we are all sort of in this bubble together. And one of the, um, I think especially today with today's uh, younger lawyers, everybody's very technologically connected. And so it's often difficult to restrain yourself from making public comments about matters that are before the court, because I know a lot of law students, they love, you know, the, the topics of the day. They like getting into the weeds about uh, what's going on in court as do our law clerks. And so uh, that's one of the biggest, the first lessons I think that, and, and biggest lessons that they learn is that once you're here, you're sort of under the cone of silence and you're in it together. And so you have to have a lot of mutual respect and trust and faith in one another. 
and um, you become a very small family here because of the isolation. Um, in the times of COVID, what it really taught us here in the judiciary is that we also have to figure out how to be flexible and how to, how to be creative about how to address some of these, um, especially uh, criminal cases where individuals have a right to a speedy trial and a speedy re resolution of their matter. And so um, we were blessed nationally to have a really um, highly esteemed panel of federal judges, both on the federal courts and the appellate courts, to come together very quickly to um, uh, advance some amendments to um, the national, the CARES Act that went, went forward with the first, um, the, the first delivery of the COVID relief to adjust uh, for emergencies uh, how to, we, how to um, continue court operations when we're, for all intents and purposes were shut down. And so that permitted us for the first time to have video teleconference hearings and even teleconference hearings. And so that was really critical. So um, I think being here in the judiciary, people, people often think that if we're not on the bench, we're not working. And oftentimes we're working very, very hard, even harder than we are on the bench in our chambers. So um, those are just a couple of my comments. Thank you, Judge. That's very helpful. And uh, uh, it is really true that, that those bonds between the judges and clerks and personnel uh, become very close. You really come to rely upon one another. And uh, that's one of the things that makes clerking or working uh, with judges so enjoyable and you get to learn so much. Um, well, one of the things that I want to uh, build off of is in the questions today, there's so many things that are coming in from candidates about um, their, you know, whether this is a good time to go to law school and, you know, are applications up or are they down? And I can share that they're, they're actually up quite a bit this year, which I'm very encouraged by because each of the panelists has shared challenges that our world has, and we need uh, law to help address those. So I'm glad to see a very good year in terms of admission. And that also doesn't uh, mean that anyone should wait. If, you know, if they think this is the right time for them, then you should, you should proceed. And, uh, and, and there's still time to apply for next fall. Um, but in our closing uh, minutes here, we, we only have a, a time for a brief closing remark from each person because we're down to just about three minutes left. But I do want to ask each of you if you could just, you know, in a few words, share any closing comment you'd like to. And please know that you have our great thanks. And uh, Judge Hamitawa, I'll ask you to go first and then Justice Whitener and then Dean Ingram. Justice Whitener, let me go ahead and ask you to go ahead. I think we may have uh, uh, lost the, the judge again. Um, thank you, Dean Testy, for having me on the program. What I would say is this is a perfect time to join the legal profession. If you're a marginalized individual as myself, your voice is definitely needed at this time. I'd also like to touch on the clerkship question that was asked. It is not the only path to the judiciary especially for marginalized individuals, because we do not have that support network in place, which is why the program LSAC is, is needed. Your program is needed. Um, because you can get to the judiciary by one, picking a profession, being known for being really good at it, and being seen by the judiciary, and they then snatch you up and mentor you, which was my path. I never did the, the clerkship. Writing is really important and take advantage of any writing courses that you have. Even if you're not on the bench, as a litigator, your writing can win the day. So the law right now needs marginalized voices at the table because representation matters and our perspective, um, the, the judiciary and the legal profession is really looking at the other perspective and trying to figure out where they went wrong and how they can address some issues that historically have never been addressed. So 
thank you again. But I do think there's a need for more lawyers, more judges from marginalized backgrounds, whatever that is, at the table. And I would encourage everyone to apply. Now's a great time. Thank you, Justice Whitener. And I want to just put a big exclamation point on that. I agree so strongly with you. And thank you for those remarks. Dean Ingram, I'd like to give you a chance for a closing comment as well. Well, thank you for the opportunity and, and for being able to um, share remarks. I, I agree with Justice Whitener wholeheartedly. Now is an excellent time to apply to law school. And focusing on the volume of applicants, um, I think is a distraction. If it helps, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that many, not all, law schools are, their class size was smaller this year. So for some of us, there may be an opportunity for the classes to be a little bit larger in the fall for the class of 2024. So for some of you, there may be added seats. Um, we always need more bright, intelligent, hardworking lawyers, law students. And we need students of high ethical integrity. And so I encourage you to apply and um, look forward to answering any questions that we can throughout this part of the process. But you are valued and you are desired and um, I know that you'll do well. Thank you so much, Dean Ingram. Really appreciate that. Absolutely. And uh, Judge Hamita Wa, I think uh, if I could give you a chance for a, a brief closing comment as well as we end our, our show today, I would love to hear from you. Well, um, I think the only thing that I would add um, to those comments are that um, I, I think you should um, embrace the experience of law school. I I recall um, I kind of went into law school a little bit, um, you know, hesitant. I, I didn't necessarily know that that was what I really wanted to do. But, and as a result of that, my first year, I really sort of um, resisted the urge to change my way of thinking, resisted my, my uh, the requirement that you had to get into this Socratic method of uh, being a student and also sort of that analytical thinking process because in undergrad and as, as uh, an advocate in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I was always told that I had exceptional writing skills, that, you know, you're talented, you should go to law school. But then when I got to law school, I thought, well, they're trying to change me. They're trying to change the way I think. They're trying to change the way I, I write. And so I, I resisted that a bit. In hindsight, I should have embraced it because it really is uh, critical to success in law school that you uh, write like a lawyer, that you uh, understand why it is necessary to um, build those analytical thinking skills and kind of just building uh, your um, sort of the foundation of what will then launch you into a good law career. And I also want to say that law opens up so many other opportunities, positions in administration, positions in universities, at law colleges, positions not just as advocates in the courtroom, but advisors in large companies, in small companies. And so it just will open up a whole world of opportunities for you. So look at it that way as well. Thank you, Judge. That latter point is particularly important that there's so many things one can do with a law degree and, uh, and the, it's just amazing the doors that that will open, whether it's in what we think of as law practice itself, or it's in business or government or any number of things. So uh, I want to close our program today by saying to the candidates, uh, what a wonderful opportunity we've had today uh, to hear from three terrific panelists, um, really legendary in what each of them have done in their own careers. And I can't thank uh, Judge Hamitawa Justice Whitener and Dean Ingram enough for being with us today. And so thank you all so much. 
and candidates, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this will be posted as a recording so that you can refer to it again. And please know that there's so many of us that want to encourage your journey. Our ne world needs diverse voices in law to work for justice. And LSAC will always be here with our schools to help you. So if there's anything you need, start with lsac.org and we'll make sure you get that help. And uh, again, panelists, thank you so much. It was an honor to be with you today. I wish you all the best. Please stay safe and well, everyone. And please tune in next time for a future candidate webinar at LSAC. Thank you.